Welcome everyone. My name is Leslie G. I'm with ROI Communication. So excited to be together with all of you. Uh, today, we're going to focus on AI and chat GPT, a topic that I know has been top of mind for everybody. We're joined by ROI's digital experience experts, Melanie Barna and Byron Witt, for um, a great conversation on the impact of AI on internal comms. So now I will turn it over to Melanie and Byron to get us started. Thank you, Leslie. So I will introduce uh, the alter ego versions of ourselves. Uh, that is uh, what you might think of as a very creepy avatar of myself talking, but it's a AI generated video of myself using a profile picture using a, a certain AI a platform. And this was an avatar version of Byron. And what we can take away from this is just that there are a lot of emerging technologies and things and tools to play with. Uh, you know, I've been interested in AI since I was a CS major in college and my professors would warn us of the impending doom of humankind because of AI and because of computer privacy. So I, you know, that was at the time I built my first computer and I really got into the nuts and bolts of how all of this worked. Of course, that was the early 2000s before we all had smartphones and kind of lived in the universe of AI unbeknowingly um, every single day. But it is something that I've always been interested in. And that's kind of the journey that I've been on to try and, and understand some of the technology and especially what's been happening in the last year. Byron, what's your, what does your journey look like? <laughs> uh, my journey, uh, my journey is just, I uh, started out in, in communications, but always had an interest in technology, I absolutely self-described nerd. Um, so I've been using AI just to express myself. Uh, you'll see these at this avatar I created a while back. Um, and I look like I have a Biore strip on my forehead there, but <laughs> interest in technology and really interested in how, um, the future of AI is actually going to, uh, intersect with communications and make our lives easier. So that's great. Just, you know, from our, from our quick introductions, you can see that we have fun with this, right? Uh, AI can be really fun. We're going to talk about a lot of the things that are uh, concerning and a lot of the issues today and a lot of the ways you use it, but, but it is also fun and it's something that we all need to be prepared to play with. Okay. So let's jump into our agenda today. We're going to talk about how it works. We're going to talk about using the tools and actually do some live demos. And then we're going to dive into the guardrails and some of the things we need to be concerned about. And that list is long. So what, I, what I'm aware of is that we can all learn from each other. You know, this is a moment in time. There's a lot of information that, that is continuing to come out and a lot of really good information and resources out there on, on things that companies can be doing in order to safeguard themselves against some of the things that are coming in the, the field of AI. So... I, I asked ChatGPT and Bard, because there are multiple models and they all have their own neural networks fueling them, what they felt about um, how this would impact the communication profession. Will it be disruptive? Because that is definitely one thing, you know, having done a lot of change communication and having seen a lot of different new waves of information coming at companies, what, you know, we, we all know how disruptive uh, change can be. And so Bard said, it took a, a few blinking moments, which is usually a little longer than it typically takes to answer in one word. And it said, potentially. Chad GPT said, uh, blinked for a good five seconds, which usually it starts to generate an answer quicker than that. And it just said no. <laughs> and I think all of us could say that the human answer to that question is yes, right? That we all know that it's going to be disruptive and it's going to change the way that people work. It's going to change the way that people interact. So if anything, it gives you a, a sense of uh, Chad GPT's understanding of itself and what it means to the universe of humans, it, it definitely doesn't self-analyze <laughs> or have context. But we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. So how it all works. Okay, so my perspective, and I think I shared a little bit of that just a second ago, is about how we can all work to build digital fluency, right? I know that there's a lot of different knowledge levels on this topic. Um, my hope here today is to create some general understanding for those who are completely new to this um, to help you all build a little digital fluency on the things that might be new. This article I read recently from Harvard Business Review basically shared the eight things you should all be doing now as this AI wave approaches. And the number one thing was to build your technical knowledge base, right? I know this doesn't always come naturally to every type of person. Some people are more focused on the words and writing or people in the human experience, but understanding the technology about how it all works is really important because as this becomes really front of every conversation at, at the, the companies we all work at, it's going to be important that communication professionals have a seat at the table and bring the human perspective. And in order to do that, you really do need to have an understanding, right? It gives you, it validates 
what you're sharing and your point of view when you can have a background of, of understanding and how these things are actually built and work. And it's not, we're going to try and simplify some of it today. So it's not like we're going to go into the deep, deep, deep details, but we will get a little nerdy for a second and just talk about neural networks and artificial intelligence and how it's all built. So the word artificial intelligence is one that everyone is throwing around a lot. I had a conversation just only yesterday and they said, artificial intelligence, it's here now. And, and, and really it's been around since the fifties. Artificial intelligence started with just basic inputs uh, and trying to mimic human interaction. And it has evolved over time, it basically has moved from artificial intelligence to machine learning, and then to the most recent advancements in predictive AI and generative AI. And generative AI is the terminology really that uh, aligns with what we're talking about today. And just to help you understand a little bit about the difference, when you hear people talk about machine learning, it's where computers can learn and then layer on top of what it has been programmed to do. Predictive AI is basically a neural network tra like training itself on recognizing patterns. And that kind of information really hasn't been possible or that kind of learning hasn't been possible um, until there was this proliferation of content on the internet, right? All these digital formats that it could actually learn from this vast universe and you know an advancement in computer processing, right? Our computers got much better and much faster and are continuing exponentially. So all of this is kind of coming to a head now because of these overlapping capabilities, the high, high powered processors, the vast amount of digital content that actually a computer a brain or a neural network can learn from. And what, what happened is in, in predictive AI, they had all these models that were learning about uh, patterns and recognizing things and looking at a visual or looking at text and being able to, to understand data points that then gave it a, an answer. I could summarize that this is a document that this, that's about this particular topic with this particular nuance. And they started to think to themselves, well, let's let's take the summary and see if we can generate something from that, right? As opposed to just analyzing something that exists, let's take the summary of what exists and create. And that's what generative AI really does. It is the ability to use text-based prompts and summarization to create new things that don't exist based on the knowledge base. We have a lot of different models and a lot of different types of generative AI. So generative AI is just is not just like chat GPT. There are all these different language-based models, which you see here in this little circle. And that's what we're going to focus on today because that's what chat GPT is. But there's in generative AI models for predictive learning. There's generative AI models for computer vision, um, for robotics. You hear about them in the uh, biopharma space, learning about image recognition and, and predictability in, in diagnosing diseases and things like that. So there's all different kinds, but we are focused on the natural language one, which is what ChatGPT is built for. And the reason that's important is because it gives you a sense of what its focus is and what it is programmed to do, right? What its intention was when the neural networks that fuel chat GPT were being built. So these large language models, it's important to understand what they are. They don't search the internet for answers. So each model was released at a different period of time. Uh, the first one, like I think 20, in the 2020, and it had learned up until that point on the content that was available in digital format. And subsequent models were released later and had learned additional information based on what, what those release dates were. So it is trained on all of that digital content um, and it learns through additional periodic training and your queries and inputs. So everything that we ask it is fueling its ability to learn and interpret. Um, even in chat GPT, there's an ability to kind of say, this was a good answer, or this was not a good answer. So it's getting better uh, at understanding, but it's also absorbing everything you say to it, which is a, a really important thing to note as we work our way <laughs> into what you should and shouldn't do, giving it proprietary information. It's gonna absorb that into its neural recesses and then understand and know that information. So it's really a, a thing to be careful about. One thing to note, Bing a Chat, which launched recently, is an exception to this, where it's an application layered on top of Chat GPT. And so it has the ability to search the internet as it's also getting the answer from chat GPT and then fusing that uh, as a result that it provides you as an answer. So it is one that actually can bring more current content and topics um, to the conversation. Actually, there's not much to tell. I'm not much more than an interpreter and not very good at telling stories. Well, not at making them interesting anyway. This is a <laughs> C-3PO. If you all remember C-3PO from the early Star Wars, and some of us are, are kind of Star Wars geeks and still love uh, C-3PO. He is a 
a, a perfect example of what we're talking about here when it comes to language models. He is really good at languages and interpreting, right? That was the whole premise of his character in Star Wars. Um, and he would even admit it in that clip. He admits it that he says, I'm not very good at stories. I'm, I'm only good at interpreting. He says it quite a few times, actually, in the different movies. And he's not very good in a crisis, I think, if any of you have watched the movies. And he's really terrible at fighting bad guys. And so we say all of this just to say, why do we need to understand why these language models exist, how they're built? Or don't we just want to use the technology? Well, it does give you a sense of the parameters of where you use them and how you use them and also what they're not good at. We'll talk about some of the things it is good at. And it's really good at generating human-like text, right? Chatbots, uh, providing statistical information, language translation, really good at language translation. It is good at assistant tasks. Now, that's not necessarily using the direct chat GPT interface, but in adding chat GPT to other applications, which we're going to start to see a lot of in everyday applications that we all use, it can help in note-taking. In this meeting alone, I know Zoom is launching Zoom IQ with the AI features to be able to do note-taking in your meeting and then summarize the text. There's a lot of different applications that are going to be integrating some of the features of these language models. Summarizing understanding, so taking a full document and in moments, summarizing it down into the key themes. And it can do it a lot faster than humans. And we have to kind of embrace the idea that there are some tasks and some things that this technology will do that will be better than the way that we've traditionally done them. This type of language model will become foundational to every human interaction app employees use that we use, that we see inside of companies. Uh, it's not a question of whether or not it will be integral, but when. What you see here is what a lot of applications are doing now. You take a database of company knowledge, you layer on chat GPT or a similar model, and then it becomes uh, an application or it gets deployed into an application that is a direct line to employees, having conversations with employees, whether it's the chat bot that they interact with, it's the, the support model that they have inside of Slack, where you can at mentioned <laughs> The, the character, ChatGPT Chat or Claude, or I saw one named Anton inside of Slack, um, and you can ask it to summarize your notes. Um, it will be everywhere, and it will be the front line of conversations that, that employees are having um, on a regular basis. So you can see here just a preview of the generative AI landscape that is continuing <laughs> to just evolve on a daily basis. I think we're probably already out of date with the list of, of applications here, but you see them in text and video and image and coding and speech and others. And it reminds me a little bit of the dot-com boom where all of a sudden a million different uh, websites popped up. And it, it's everybody taking that chat GPT interface, their API, which they make freely available and integrating it into an application where you can interact with it and it can do certain tasks for you. Byron is going to start by giving us a demo on some different ways that communicators are using ChatGPT. Thank you, Melanie, for that very informative um, under the hood explanation of AI and ChatGPT. Uh, really interesting. But what we want to talk about now is really what are the, the practical uses of ChatGPT AI, um, how it's being used in other companies. There, uh, there is a uh, maturity model that was created by Gartner. And this infographic shows you the fact that companies, and by the way, this is not just communicators inside of companies, this is just companies in general. So it may be skewed a little bit, maybe a lot of product and technology folks are using AI inside of companies that, that definitely shows up here. But the, the big takeaway is that 52% of folks are, are experimenting. They're trying it out. They're kicking the tires with AI and probably chat GPT. At least 59% of folks are actually appropriating it into their work, which is no surprise. But the recent chat GPT became so popular so quick, it's, it seemed like it just appeared uh, in late November, early December was two things. One, um, th there was a much better user experience. You had that interface of just putting your, your queries and your prompts into it. And then also the engine behind ChatGPT found its way into APIs across a lot of other tools. So if you're wondering why ChatGPT, where did it come from? Why is it now in the zeitgeist? That's why. You're not gonna lose your job to ChatGPT. There's still gonna be need for writers, but our skill sets are gonna change slightly. So this research really showcases the fact that, sure, meat and potatoes writing, 
grammar checking, proofing, um, that probably is going to be moved over to some, some AI in the future. Also, our friends in technology who actually build websites and code, yeah, that's going to be done by a lot of AI uh, in the future. But at the top, you'll see something really interesting. There's a new skill set opportunity, and that is the ability to write really good AI prompts and really work well with uh, AI tools like ChatGPT. So it's also an opportunity to learn more about how to use ChatGPT effectively. Thinking about you know, the, all the different types of content that can be created uh, via ChatGPT, here's just a smattering of uh, what a lot of folks are using, again, from this most recent research. People are creating emails, uh, social posts, they're writing articles, press releases, formatting and structuring presentations, like Melanie and I did, actually, would be completely transparent. We actually use ChatGPT to outline, brainstorm, uh, putting together this, this program today. Heavily edited, right, Byron? <laughs> we heavily edited ChatGPT's original version, for sure. There are a couple other ways that you can use it as well. It's great to just put in a question or a problem, sort of like researching it. Again, it's great for being a facilitator for brainstorming. A great prompt is, give me 10 ideas for blah. And good old-fashioned just writing assistance or writing helper, a proofer. A lot of us use maybe some, some tools now, such as Grammarly or WordTune. ChatGPT takes it to the next level of being able to really not only help you with just proofing some writing that you want to, to share, but also thinking about different ways of, of storytelling. Uh, personalized messages. Um, you can, you know, write multiple messages to different people, just pop in who they are and, and who they are in the organization. Um, for translations, this is a, this is a great tool for that. Um, the translation is very accurate compared to a lot of the other translation tools that are out there. Often as communicators, we get just tons of content, a lot of data that we have to make sense out of. Uh, how great is it to put that data into uh, an engine and then ask back if this a synopsis or just give us the high points or what we should know? And things like, uh, you know, building newsletter content. And of course, as Melanie and I have mentioned, you know, actually using ChatGPT through prompts to help write an outline for a presentation, which we did do. But we definitely um, improved upon ChatGPT's response to us. So some guardrails. I want to make you aware of some things that can possibly go wrong and also give you some best practices on, on things you can do. So this is a great thing that happened a couple of months ago. There was a AI video agency that created a mashup of what if Wes Anderson created a Star Wars movie? And it became a huge viral hit. The, the, the audio is not playing. You can go watch this. I've watched it probably about a dozen times, and I'm always amazed by the level of detail. But this is a really great use uh, and really kind of amazing in the fact that it looks so real. People thought Wes Anderson was actually going to, to direct a Star Wars movie. But alas, the fanboys were very un unhappy and sad because that, that did not happen. Another interesting pop culture viral event was a couple of months ago, if you haven't seen this, um, someone decided that um, the Pope really needed to step up his fashion game and actually did a mashup, created an AI image. And uh, in this particular image, people really thought that the Pope was partnering with the House of Balenciaga. Not the case, uh, but it went viral. And no matter how much we want to see the Pope dressed this way, this did not actually happen. I think the biggest takeaway here is really that seeing is no longer believing. That's the biggest challenge and concern about some of these AI-generated images. They're going to be better than what you might expect even in a real-world photograph, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference in the next uh, situation. Recently. Somebody created an AI-generated image of the Pentagon on, on fire. It was picked up by news organizations thinking it was legitimate. And then all of a sudden it caused the stock market to dip and people were reacting to it in real time, thinking it was real. So irresponsible use of these tools has real world impact. And there is a real need for uh, an understanding of them and a regulation just so that we can hopefully avoid what seems to be a, a mounting wave of disinformation that could be coming our way. It's not just the imagery too. Visual generative AI is kind of an obvious way that that can be a problem, but text generation is just as concerning. I'm sure all of you heard the recent case uh, in the news with the lawyer who cited court cases um, in his filing uh, from ChatGPT, and he'd done the research on ChatGPT, even asking 
are these accurate? Is this factual information? And of course, ChatGPT said yes, just like in the beginning when I said, oh, or, or, or is this going to impact communication professionals and just be disruptive? And it said, no, of course not. It works from a place that does not understand or can create and fabricate information because it only has a finite universe that it's been trained on. And it basically derives the information and the answers from its knowledge base. But there's a lot more to human understanding that goes beyond that. Another example is how Samsung, the developers there were using the coding functionality to try and ask how to do something in code, entering in some of their code, asking it to debug it. And some of the code that they entered was proprietary and revealed some trade secrets and it was input into the chat GPT neural network. And so they basically revealed company secrets. It's gotten to the point that um, Stack Overflow, kind of the universal place where developers go to exchange ideas about coding and, and troubleshooting. They've outlawed any AI generated code just because it can be problematic and wrong. In addition to just being something that then if you're using the tool, you're revealing some information by sharing the code that you've developed. So there's a lot of different things to think about. And there's huge ethical considerations, right? Um, we talked about all the things you can use a uh, chat GPT for, but when using AI and content, it doesn't do well with why, it doesn't rationalize or self-analyze. It does not understand nonverbal. It has no judgment or intuition. And so when you think about the ethics of it, like it boils down to, it doesn't have emotion or empathy, right? It doesn't have a sense of right and wrong. It's basically inputs and outputs. Inputs, summarization, reweighting information, and then outputting the answers. Um, it has no sense of context for your specific company or your employees, right? It can't be nuanced in that way. So all of that can be a real challenge when it comes to using it. And that's why there are a lot of reasons to be <laughs> cautious in how you implement it. Julie, I saw that you entered in chat that some companies are creating their own proprietary systems. And that's really important for privacy reasons. A lot of companies are doing that, right? They're creating their own models that are the backbone to their applications so that, that some of those things can be more controlled. Um, the answers that it gives can be more controlled and the information is in a private space. It's not universal, but when you use chat GPT as kind of this standalone application from OpenAI, it will inevitably have that information go into the, the vortex of its neural networks. And it also won't have any sort of parameters or filters on some of that. So these are just like a whole list. And honestly, there's probably a million more, but there's a lot of things here, you know, from enabling bad actors who can do serious harm to harming company reputations, information leaks, security breaches. Think about a phishing scam where it's the actual voice that sounds just like the voice of, of someone you know, of a coworker, of your mother. It's a lot more complicated to weed out what's true and what's fake um, when you have tools that are the sophisticated generating that content. And then there's also the job loss and burnout area. If you are expected to be on and to just do the strategic work and the computers are doing all of the production work and just generating the, the presentation for you right away. You're, you're living in strategic, you're, you're living in, in volume 10 all day long in the work that you're doing. And you're expected to then output the final product more quickly because you know the AI created it for you. And all you have to do is just you know, edit it. So there's a lot of concerns around burning out people who are then now using these tools. Just to show you here, it is also improving really quickly. <laughs> so this is the mid journey tool that um, is also from open AI. And you see in the span of a little over a year, uh, a prompt of Captain Jack Sparrow went from something uh, a little creepy and unrecognizable to the current version that you see on the right. And it's remarkable how sophisticated it's getting at doing this kind of thing. So I'm getting ahead of the wave now by putting a stopgap policy in place, getting cross-functional leaders aligned around just where everything is. Um, it's not just an IT problem or an executive problem. I mentioned in the very beginning, it's really important that we have communicators and other humanistic type roles at the seat of the table talking about what this means for the universe of our of our companies and how it's going to impact employees and what the pros and cons are and really just being really holistic and thoughtful also about our culture and what you want an ethical stance on things but getting some sort of policy in place just as a starting place i saw one company generated just a, a blanket statement saying we are not going to ai generate any new content of our employees featuring our employees or leaders and that was their policy, like we're not going to create anything. And, and it gives a sense of relief maybe to the employees who, when this technology comes to bear, can know what to expect. And that's just like an ethical stance one company took, but there's lots of different ways to define it. And then make sure that whatever you do, that you have uh, an approach that evolves over time, because this technology itself, if the last few months have shown us anything, that it's going to continue to evolve every month, there's going to be a new advancement or a new thing to consider and deal with.